please take your seats. It is time to pay homage to the world of walk. Welcome to Policy Idol 2018. and I'm delighted to be back once again as your, as your compeer, your host for this annual celebration of all things wonky. Now in its fourth glorious year, Policy Idol occupies a, a unique place in the, in the Venn diagram of public life. <laughs> Straddling as it does the lozenge labelled making the world a better place, with another marked glittering talent show and a third that says savoury snacks and alcohol. Uh, we are at the conjunction of powerful forces that have proved in years past to be inspiring, uplifting and joyful affairs. So welcome to one and to all. Now, if, um, if public policy making was a car, what kind of car would it be? Right now, I reckon it's an old banger parked up in Whitehall with three flat tyres and steam pouring from its bonnet. Uh, forward movement has uh, completely ceased. Uh, as you know, the, the Queen's speech has been cancelled, uh, and the government's legislative programme reads more like a departure board for Southern Railways on a, on a snowbound Monday. Delays and cancellations uh, absolutely everywhere. So the demands of Brexit mean there is something of a vacuum in the space where brilliant policy ideas should live. However, we in this room, we abhor a vacuum. So tonight, we are challenging some of the, the finest minds from one of the world's finest places of learning, to light up that space with their brilliance. We are looking for policy ideas that are fresh, imaginative, practical, and inspiring. Each of the 10 finalists bidding to become Policy Idol Champion 2018 will pitch their policy to you, our gorgeous audience, and to our esteemed panel of judges. And what judges we have, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jennifer Rubin, yes, Jennifer, uh, is Executive Chair of the Economic and Social Research Council, the ESRC, and many of you will know that until quite recently she was Director of the Policy Institute here at King's, and she chairs our all-female judging panel. Fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, next up, Funmi Olina Shakin uh, is, was actually was once a student here at, at King's, completing a PhD in War Studies, I believe. Uh, she is now one of the most sought-after experts on conflict, leadership, development, peace building, an advisor to the UN Secretary General, as well as a Vice President International here at King's College. Baroness Sally Morgan was appointed Tony Blair's political secretary in 1997, spent many years in Downing Street as both a minister and an advisor. She went on to chair Ofsted, the school's inspectorate, and is now chair of Future Leaders, which looks to build a network of exceptional school leaders across the country. And finally, Polly McKenzie is director of Demos and knows all about the realities of policy making at the heart of government. She was director of policy to the Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, during the coalition. What a fantastic panel we have, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but they aren't the only judges. Uh, you, ladies and gentlemen, must also have your say. After all ten of our contestants have performed, you can vote for your favourite with the prestigious audience prize for the winner. Now, as well as that, can I draw to your attention the cards you should have found on your, on your tables um, or chairs that, you, that we, we'd like you to fill out? They, uh, if you've got one, they should ask, in your dreams, what policy would change the world? Have you all got one of those? Some of you may have already filled them out. If you haven't, we'd really like you to do them. We're up for anything at all. Uh, and when you've filled them out, um, you can try and get it done, you know, sort of, by the time we get to sort of five or six, I think they should be done by then. Uh, but, uh, Policy Institute staff will collect them, and they're going to hand them to our Creative Connections friend who's over there waving. What's your name? Sam. S Sam. Sam. Sam from Creative Connections. Uh, a brilliant artist who will turn your cards into a dream wall. Uh, there's the dream wall. I, I'm imagining a sort of vast Freudian landscape uh, <laughs> that reveals just a little bit too much about us all. Can't wait. Should be fantastic. So if you haven't had the thrill 
of attending Policy Idol before. Uh, this is how the, the evening is going to work. Each idol will pitch their policy idea against the clock. They have just three minutes to convince you and the judges who will mark their presentation on substance and on style. So that's what the judges do. How well did our contestants marshal the evidence to support their policy idea? And how well would it work? And how well did they, did they set it? They've got uh, three minutes, as I say, if they go over a little bit, the judges, well, they can be pretty brutal, those judges. They may, may decide to uh, detract a mark or two. But if they are still going after three and a half minutes, ignominy will be heaped upon humiliation, <laughs> upon embarrassment, upon mortification as I ruthlessly intervene. Right there is the jeopardy that we TV folks are always looking for. <laughs> there are four prizes, one award for the presentation with the greatest substance, another award for the presentation delivered with the greatest style, uh, both of those are uh, from our judges, we'll make those decisions. Then there's your audience prize, which is, a, which is a bit like that TV award that Ant and Deck win every single bloody year. And last but not least, of course, our overall winner, our Policy Idol 2018. Right, it is time. Time for our first Policy Ideal Idol 2018 presentation. Our first contestant is Alice Stretch, who is in her third year studying politi political economy and her policy idea is entitled Caring Students. Alice, come up. Alice, you're first up. You have three minutes to sell. Are you ready for this? You've made it a lot more scary since then. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to calm you down. No more than three minutes to convince us about your idea of caring students starting now. Standing in front of you today is quite daunting. And most people find public speaking scary. But what if making a cup of coffee, getting out of bed in the morning, and going to the toilet were as daunting? What if you knew you needed help with each of these tasks every single day? That is the reality for one in three people in their lifetime. And with a growing population and ageing society, it will be the reality for most people in this room. But the answer could also be in this room. Well, almost. It could be at universities. That's why my policy is caring students. This links students in care-related subjects to local care homes to assist with the care shortage whilst providing income, experience and flexibility. So, what's the problem? The current care system. At the moment, 30% of people receive no help at all. And it's a growing problem. There are 90,000 vacancies in the care system. And this is one area to look at. The cost to use an agency is £18 per hour, but that agency carer only gets paid £8.90. So how will the policy work? I'll give you three examples. Firstly, Ritu. She's a medicine undergraduate. She'd like to be a doctor, either back home in India or in the UK. She wants um, experience before her hospital placement next year and her family pay for her tuition and living costs. She could be a caring student, receiving the experience she wants, and the income, instead of going to her, could be a reduction on her tuition fees instead. Secondly, Laura. She's a nursing undergraduate. Her partner works 9 to 5 during the week, and she wants to be a health visitor. They have a child, and they need more household income. She could be a caring student, working occasional nights in a residential care home, and this provides her with her income for her young family. And Emily. She's a psychology undergraduate. She wants to be a social worker, and she's free except around her deadlines. She's looking for a part-time job with flexibility, and she has a car with her at university. She could be a caring student with a job that gives her the flexibility she likes, and she can work in community care, visiting clients at their homes. So why will it work? Well, for every £18 you pay for an agency carer, you can afford two student carers at national living wage. The economies of scale with such a broad, um, with such a, a large workforce, where it's cheaper to train and manage them, and it's mutually beneficial. So, an example in the Netherlands, linking students um, to uh, care housing, so students live in housing cheaper. Um, it's the vast majority of students say they value it out the scheme and have recommended it to friends. And finally, opportunity. So, having more carers is not just about comfort in care; it's about providing the opportunity. 
For students, it's a learning experience. And for the farmer who spent decades working outside and is now in a wheelchair, he can now be taken outside to see the outside world again. For the saxophonist whose Parkinson's has left him unable to play and housebound, he can now attend a jazz concert. And for me, in 60 years' time, I'll probably say, I don't want to be a burden. But care shouldn't be a burden. We should value it as a society, and that's why we should introduce caring students. Thank you. Thank you. She is brutal at three and a half, let me tell you. Uh, uh, we, we're hearing her throughout the, uh, throughout the evening. Uh, so, Alice, uh, we're, we're going to let the uh, judging panel loose on you now. Um, for each of our panellists, I'm going to ask, um, ask them about the substance and the style. And for me, I want you to, to kick us off with your thoughts and questions on uh, Alice's the substance of her presentation. I, I think Alice fascinating. I, I... I enjoy that very much. I just wanted to get a sense from you. This income, uh, you mentioned earlier the income going to fees. Uh, how, how does that work? Um, so the point I was saying about linking uh, to fees was mainly because there's um, a whole sector of students who work who are in this kind of care-related subject, and a lot of them aren't necessarily, if they aren't looking for a part-time job, there is other value to be had here. Mm. So it's just kind of to suggest that there are additional models for this to work. So if somebody um, who wants to have experience but their parents pay their tuition, this gives them another incentive to get involved. And um, as I said with the Dutch example, there is a lot of value to being a carer whilst being a student as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Can I just ask you about yes, this? Can, can I just ask you about I mean, I, th I, I love this. And I've seen, I've read about the Dutch model. I think it's really interesting because I think the thing that you didn't have time, yeah. or you, you <laughs> used the Dutch model as your headline, but actually, that, you know, having young people around, around older people is so fantastic. So that's a big plus in itself. Mm. I'm just intrigued as to how you'd. How, how you'd broker it, what's the mechanism for brokering mm -hmm. the relationship really, because I don't think it's quite as simple as saying therefore two equals 18 yeah. pounds because there must be an overhead and a, you know, a mechanism and I'm just wondering what thinking you've done about that. Yeah, so at the moment there's about 21,000 organisations that provide care and the majority of them have fewer than six staff, so in that case you have a lot of people with the overheads for each individual caring relationship. Mm -hmm. So as there's uh, about 240,000 students across all the year groups who are in the kind of the subjects I was focusing on, um, being able to have that such a big body of workforce means that you can um, cut the economies of scale with that. And also, um, yeah, like you said about the intergenerational uh, thing, I think that's really mm. important as well. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and also just running from an organisation such as the university. So at King's, for example, we have King's Talent Bank, which is where we use we employ student ambassadors and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you also have the organisational and reputational back, uh, backing, which you might not have with direct payments and other forms of care and personal mm -hmm. assistance and things like that. Okay. I, I'm going to bring Jennifer in. You, you've got, you, you, want, you to think about the style. How did she? How did she do it? Great. Well, thank you, Alice. Uh, really, really interesting. Very, actually, persuasively, I thought, mm. delivered. Um, quite a compelling uh, style and, and actual substance as well. Um, so, but my question, I suppose, about style would be, so it's, it's great to make an argument for something and make it very powerfully as you have and convincingly. Um, in some ways, that can be strengthened even further, so I'll give you the opportunity to do so, when you actually put forward the, some of the risks and downsides of something so, and how you might mitigate those. Because that, that's, that's the one thing I, I was you know, really wondering, apart from the brokering uh, question that Sally's asked, is, is you know, what might be some of the risks? How, how do we know the student? Will they be well trained? Will they, how do we know they'll deliver what they really need to be delivering to be good carers? And, and who will manage that? So the three examples I gave, um, Ritu, Emily and Laura, Emily and Laura are my sisters and Ritu is a friend of mine from university who was asking for experience and I shared um, what my sisters had done. Mm -hmm. So I know that it works for them and um, what made me think of this idea was the fact that a lot of the risks that currently exist in the care system are things like um, my sister Laura who needed a bit more time off around exams, mm -hmm. it's difficult to go to an agency and say... Um, can I not do that shift next week, I need to revise, because they might not give you further shifts, but if there's an organisation that's linked to a university, they have a bit more knowledge of what the pressures are. Um, but in terms of risks, yeah, so um, at the moment when you go into a care home, you have three days of compulsory training, or three compulsory training courses, mm -hmm. so you have um, diversity and inclusion, safeguarding, moving and handling, and then 
but depending on the care home, you have additional training. So what I was saying about the savings there is those three, um, some are taught online currently, um, but others could be taught in a lecture style. So you could have it as everybody who's interested to come into university and sit in a 150-seat lecture theatre, and then you save the, agent, the care homes that cost. Um, but that training, yeah, so uh, that training would be have to, the Kings would have a relationship with, say, 20 care homes, and they'd organise with the care homes what training was needed, mm -hmm. and so that would probably be something that they could meet to the standards. Excellent. Well, it's certainly a problem we need to solve. So yeah, thank you very much for having it. It's always tough going first, and, and because it's going to be a, a, a long evening, I want you to make sure you do jot down now your thoughts, your notes on, on all, of the, uh, all of the contestants so that you can pick your favourite for that uh, audience award later in the evening. Now, our second pitch comes from Mansour Hassan Khan, who is studying public policy and management at the Business School. His proposal is called Gross National Happiness, a Development Framework. Mansour, if you'd like to come up here, please. Right. Mansour, good luck. You have three minutes starting now. Good evening, judges, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm going to sell you something which is unsaleable happiness. Let me just start with a story. There was a person sitting under a tree relaxing. Another person passed by and asked him, why are you just sitting idle? Why don't you do something? He said, why should I do something? He said, if you do something, you'll earn money. He said, why should I earn money? If you earn money, you'll buy so many things and be happy. He said, I'm already happy, why should I all this, do all these kind of things? So I just wanted to start with the premise that the happiness is an important indicator which we need to understand. Right now what we are doing is that we are measuring the GDP. Let's look at the GDP of the UK. It's growing every year, it's growing fast. The volume is specific, volume is heavy. But is it giving the right picture? Let us just see it further. What's happening? There's huge enough economic inequality. 47, 43% of the children in Tower of Hamlet are poor. There's large number of houseless people increasing every year. Then we have the pollution, the problem of pollution, the death due to pollution, bad governance, the problem of immigration. We have the gender inequality, the problem of NHS waiting time. Just 12% of the land is in the UK is the forest cover. All these kind of problems are there, but the GDP slide is showing that everything is going fine. So there is some kind of discrepancy in the measurement of GDP. As rightly Stiglitz and David Cameron has come up that the GDP is not the right indicator. We have to come up and we have to go beyond it. There is something wrong with it. Therefore, I mean, uh, you can also, also look at the Easterlin paradox. It doesn't say that the life satisfaction level and the GDP goes hand in hand. They are not together. So therefore, we need to understand that GDP is not the right factor. It, is it measurable? Yes, it, it is measurable. There are so many agencies, institutions, and techniques which are in place and doing fine, like HDI, OECD Better Life Index, Ecological Footprints, and other things. So now, I'm just going to propose you something which is happening in a small country called Bhutan, which is Drops Nation Happiness. It is basically based upon four pillars, equality, economic equality, environment, cultural emphasis, and good governance. On the basis of all these four pillars, we have got nine domains, and each domain had got certain indicators. Every indicator has got its own importance. The GNH is measured there by GNH Commission, a commission instituted by the government, and that institution measures on the basis of the survey conducted amongst the masses, among the people, and they come out with all these kind of indicators given different kind of weightages also. And then they rate whether there is happiness or not. I'll go further beyond. There's something more happening over there which I'd like to propose as a policy. That is policy screening. This is something very important happening in Bhutan. Every policy propounded by any of the department is subjected to be analyzed by the GNS Commission. It says whether this policy is good for the happiness coefficient of the country or not. They have got the indicators, they have different kind of weightages for everything, and then they say that this policy is good or bad and is reverted. So in the last, I'd like to just say that not everything that counts can be counted, and mm -hmm. not everything that can be counted counts. So it depends upon you whether you want the world of Yuval Harari or Lord Buddha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our media report will be giving us three minutes thirty whistle. You just crept inside. 
Well done. Now, I've, I've been to Bhutan. I've, 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 been to, I've made a whole series about happiness, and I've been to Bhutan for it. So this is a subject close to my heart. Um, but I think, Polly, you're going to be talking about the, 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 the style of this. Uh, what, what, did you, what did you make of that? Oh, it was very compelling. Lots of uh, impressive graphics and, and noise. I think it, it, the question, no, you kind of skimmed past the graph that showed that, in fact, since we've started measuring well-being in the UK, it's been going up. And so you, you bombarded us with information about how rubbish the country is um, and how everyone's miserable. Um, and yet, in fact, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Our incomes seem to be pretty stagnant, and yet somehow happiness, well-being is, is creeping up. Do you, have, do you have an explanation of that? I was a bit worried that you just kind of skimmed past it to tell us that Bhutan is better. See, the kind of, uh, the, U, the best thing about the UK is that UK is realizing it very fast. As I said that the debit government in 2010 has come up. This was really a fantastic development at that point of time that they have realized and they said that we will come up with measuring the well-being of the nation. That was something really good. But the question is that GDP right now has become completely fat. It's a craze. So everybody is just trying to have the GDP grown as fast as possible because of the fat of the political institutions as well as financial and lending institutions. They just want GDP to grow. My condition is that we may measure well-being, we may measure happiness, but we need to go further beyond that. We are right now, what the UK is doing is that we're doing the survey and measuring the pulse of the people. How is the wellness, how is the happiness level of the people? But then are we going to initialize the measurement and the screening of the policies of the government, whether they are in sync with the idea of going wellness or not? Because sometimes what is happening is that so many different kind of pressures come up over us, and they say that, no, it doesn't matter. Whatever way the uh, uh, development has to be achieved, it has to be achieved. It may happen that the uh, ecosystem and ecological system is imbalanced. But then we have to understand that all these kind of resources have different values. It is not just that economic development is important, it is the giving respect to all the different components of the ecosystem. It should be organic development. Okay, now I know Sally wants to come in and talk a bit about the substance. I'm, I'm interested in, in, the, in, in what you're talking about Bhutan. How do they, how do they actually do the measuring? Because clearly what you're, what you're saying is, if, if you compare it to the UK, yes, we do an analysis of well-being, but presumably it's on a survey, or Polly will know this better than me, but it's presumably on a, on a, in a fairly, fairly simple way. How do they put their policies through, through the, the sort of happiness um, yeah, this is sieve, really. And how do you? And why hasn't it become more popular? So it, this is a, you know, it's a great case study. But why? Why is it? Why is it still just there? And let me just uh, give you a, a little brief because I've been, uh, I was fortunate enough to serve in Bhutan for two years, and I've seen them very closely. Way back in 1972, imagine at that point of time, the fourth king of Bhutan came up with this idea of GNH. They said that no, we don't believe in GDP, we believe in GNH. Yeah. What they have done is that they have formalized the institution of it. They have come out with a cross-national happiness commission. This commission consists of independent members and experts in different areas. And then every policy which is being framed by respective department, that policy first go to the GNH commission, and then those experts, along with the survey of the different data of collected from across the country, over a period of time gradually improved upon, they evaluate every indicator upon that. For example, there's a policy of building the road, constructing the road. Suppose the road is passing through a hill where there needs to be cutting off a huge amount of trees. Then they would rate that probably this is not beneficial for the ecosystem. Or rather, if it is going to uh, fragment the habitation of the people, they may, they may say that this is not going to be good for the sociological balance of the society. So they have a very structured way of evaluating and giving the weightage to every indicator and find out the score whether this is correct or not. So then only, uh, of course, it looks, uh, for, for, from the outsider, it looks like something subjective, but no. Over a period of time, they have gradually improved upon their indicators. Okay. And right now, their uh, survey, their own survey, indicates that around 93% of their people are happy though their GDP is not very high. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. right. we've, we've unfortunately run out of time, but thank you very much indeed for answering those questions so fully. Ladies and gentlemen, Mansour Hazan Khan.
Rebecca Ortega, I think. Uh, Rebecca is also studying public policy and management at the business school, so an interesting rivalry perhaps. We're just seeing her. Her proposal is called Electric Energy for Development in Paraguay. Would you like to come up, please, Rebecca? I must say, I'm loving, I'm loving these little pictures that, that so we, um, we met Sam, so who are our other Creative Connections people there? What, what, hello? The, loving the, loving the little cartoon pictures, fantastic, the real added extra, thank you very much for being here. So, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt your flow, three minutes on electric energy for development in Paraguay, starting now. Thank you. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> that was 10 seconds of electricity loss right now, and it felt like everything stopped, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you imagine if this happens four hours every single day? Imagine if each of you go to your offices to work or study, but there's no power, no internet, in the dark and cold for hours and hours? How could you expect your children to study or universities to function? How could you expect business to operate? How could you expect a country to run? Imagine if that was happening here in the UK, because that is the reality in my country. Paraguay, located in the heart, in the heart of South America, is one of the largest producers of hydroelectric energy worldwide, but the local supply is about to collapse. Why is this? In 1973, during the negotiations, to build the massive Itaipu Dam with Brazil, which is supposed to supply ample amount of electric energy for both countries, something went wrong. Paraguay and Brazil agreed that they both will receive 50% each of the energy. However, Paraguay is only receiving 13% of these shares because there is not enough, um, there is not enough investment in transmission lines and the grid across Paraguay. So the rest is selling to Brazil at a fixed price below the market rate. So what was meant to be a fair contract, um, it just only benefit Brazil and the elite of Paraguay. So this is holding back Paraguay's development. Why would anybody will invest in a country with this sort of situation? What can be done? So incentivize the government improving governance with a, with, with a rational decision-making. And the policies are based in investment invest in Itaipu profits. Um, first, applying those profits to meet all the electric energy demand. Investing in transmission and distribution lines and the centralized electricity for rural areas. Second, have an economy that is running on 100% renewable resources. Take advantage of the potential and investing $20 million in solar energy, reaching 20% of growth solar power year on year for the next 10 years. And we, uh, Paraguay can follow uh, a model example, the model championed by Costa Rica, that they are uh, producing 100% of its electricity with renewable resources. For a sustainable future, for the future of our children, for everyone, it's not just Paraguay that needs to follow this kind of solution. It's the UK also and the rest of the world. Thank you. I love that. I have to say, I like, and you were dead on the time. Yeah. Right, so uh, Jennifer, uh, if you'd like to ask some questions about the substance of that. Thanks very much, Rebecca. That was really, really interesting and, and very, very expertly delivered, if I might say. But um, I'm not supposed to be commenting on, on style. So I have a question for you, which is about, um, presumably, this would require quite a major investment. Um, for that, presumably, one needs a, a certain amount of political stability and uh, to be able to combat what I assume are some fairly strong vested interests in the fossil fuel industry still in Paraguay. So how would that actually work in practice? Could it work? My policy is proposing um, to use authority of the government um, using uh, the uh, general population as a, the actors of the policy process with advocacies, with groups, social work, to start um, 
incentivize the, gov to incentivize the government to make a rational decision making and uh, put it first, development of the country during the negotiations. Start selling um, with a, a rational price according to the region. Uruguay is selling at $13 per kilowatt energy. However, Paraguay is just selling to Brazil at uh, $3 per, per, per watt. And this is, um, Paraguay is receiving money from a huge country such as Brazil. Um, Paraguay needs, um, it's a, needs to have those contacts because Paraguay is a lock, lock country. It depends on Brazil. It just, um, mm -hmm. we depend, our trade depends everything on, on Brazil, on Bra Argentina and every, everything. So it, uh, the authority and the rational decision making of the government is the, the most important thing in this policy. Okay. okay. Uh, Thank you. For me, your thoughts on the, on the presentation of that? Oh, wow. I, I thought that, uh, well, I imagine that the lights out yeah. were meant to achieve that effect. Yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. That was intention. I, I thought, yes, mm -hmm. I thought you got our attention with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought that was very well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. How, to what extent, I mean, how, how do you think you'd, you'd shift the government into the right place on this? Mm. We're, uh, I include myself because I'm a citizen. Yeah. We are uh, now, the, the demand is growing and growing. Yeah. The, po the population is growing. So Paraguay is a tropical country. In the summer, it's uh, really hot. Yeah. So most of the, the household, households are using no, no only one air conditioner, but they are using three or mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the demand of energy is uh, huge. So the citizens are like, they are aware right now of the problem. Because uh, the, the treat said that uh, each, uh, each country will sell to the other in case of they don't need. It's Paraguay right now needs. Yeah. Or, and that is the problem because we don't have enough infrastructure yeah. to deliver the electricity from the dam to the city. So this is the, the problem okay. right now. Okay. Okay. Um, I have to say, I knew shamefully little about Paraguay, but you have opened my eyes to at least one aspect of it. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Thank you. is James Bagley, who is Project Manager at the Menzies Centre for Australian Studies here at King's. Uh, James, do come up. James's idea is called The Universal Chance to Train, Creating a Future for All. James, you've got three minutes on that, starting now. Education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Today I would like to make the case that we are withholding that passport to the future for millions of our citizens. My policy is simple. I propose that we create a universal annual training allowance for every working age adult. The universal chance to train uses the framework of universal income to tackle some of the wider challenges citizens will face in the 21st century. So why do we need a universal chance to train? Well, over the last 10 years, Britain has seen reductions in social mobility, wage stagnation, and reduced productivity. We've also continued to witness a transformation in the world of work Technology has created new industries, however these industries require particular skills. We've seen an expansion in temporary and fixed term working. By 2020, Britain expects to have over a million temporary workers. Unfortunately, many of these workers will have little or no access to in-work training. And automation has continued to put pressure on low to medium income workers. A recent Bank of England study found that over 16 million jobs may be lost to automation and AI in the coming years. But we can make a change. The universal chance to train would expand skills funding while maintaining standards by allowing individuals to choose from certified suppliers. This has been used successfully in both Denmark and Singapore. Through the principle of universality, we would broaden access to in-work training to those who are in, uh, broaden access to education to those who are in work, recognising that many of our fellow citizens are trapped in a cycle, long hours, low pay, with no access to training. And due to the annual guarantee of training, we would make sure that citizens could keep up the disruption that trade, globalisation and technology will continue to bring. One last thing. Just think of the opportunities a universal chance to train would bring. 
a chance to tackle productivity, a chance, a chance to tackle social mobility, and perhaps, most importantly of all, for a community or a family, a chance at a new industry or a new job. I grew up in a small town in the Midlands, and yes, a town that voted overwhelmingly for Brexit. The kind of town where if you worked hard, you did the right thing, you get a promotion, a pay rise, and a chance at a better future. And yet, over years of deindustrialization and the removal of educational opportunities, that chance to move on and move up has been removed. New industries have been created, and yet too often people haven't got the skills or knowledge to access them. When you listen to these experiences, or the experiences of workers across the UK, you understand why the future is a scary place, because the future looks a lot like today. We all want a chance, a chance at a better future, a chance to prosper, a chance to train. Thank you. Very good, Jen. Punchy. You had 15 seconds in the back, actually. But anyway, uh, that's fine. Um, some of the gloomiest charts I've ever seen are on on Britain now. Um, so it's going to be Polly. Uh, Polly, on, on the substance. Yeah. Well, I thought it was a great move for productivity that you were 15 seconds uh, more efficient <laughs> than everybody yeah. else and your competitors. Um, <laughs> It's incredibly compelling, um, inspirational, so congratulations. I just wonder what kind of quantum are we looking at because it's very easy for this policy to be unaffordably expensive and it's also very easy for this policy to be so trivial that it doesn't make a difference and I wonder what you're kind of thinking about. So my initial um, estimation, so with, first of all this is being done by other major economies. France has just implemented this, Germany has been doing it for some time. Um, so, um, in terms of funding it, I would suggest to use the framework that I've put together, which would be a 1% uh, levy for businesses with over 10 employees, and then under 10, who, who really do struggle with training, there's a, there's a complete lack of training for small businesses because they can't really afford the financing, um, that would be 0.5%. In terms of the scale, in some ways that is a, a political question in a lot of ways in terms of focusing, but it would be around the £1,000 mark, and I, and I just want to actually explain why that is. Actually, we focus a lot on big-scale education, that's university. So many people actually require throughout life small bits of uh, training to keep up with the changes that automation will bring. So that's people in work, but it's also people out of work. And it, it will affect all of us, technology and automation, so that's continue, going to be a problem. That's going to be continually a problem. So it's around a thousand pound mark, which matches what they do in France, matches what they do in Singapore, but also in Denmark. And how, how do you, what kind of estimate have you made of the impact on kind of price inflation in the training market if everybody suddenly has all of this money to spend? So first of all, we uh, there was a the Labour government in '98 set up something called the New Deal. Um, one of the lessons I've tried to learn from that is having a certified supplier scheme. So actually we seek to manage the costs both in terms of inflation but also actually working with business to identify the skills that we need. So that's actually bringing business on board to recognise that there are areas they really want to work at. Just one example, in the UK we have a huge middle management problem. I'm sure a lot of people, <laughs> middle management on the most exciting subject, but we have a huge problem in that over 70% of directors recognise that they have insufficient middle managers because they, have, they don't have access to skills training. That a recent report by the consultancy Hayes found that if we can, they, that we have the capacity, if we had training, to increase middle management by 29%, that would increase economic output by 260 million. So, as noted, there are some gloomy charts up there. There's some huge opportunities. We constantly talk about technology being challenged, but people want to make, people want the opportunity. You know, people are excited, and the frustration is when they get stuck in a job, and there is at the moment no access to move up and move on. Right. Now, Sally Morgan, you, you were actually in number 10 when the new deal was, uh, was launched, so you know a little bit about that, but I want you to talk about, actually about the, the, the style, the presentation. Well, I thought the style, I thought you, were, you, you grabbed us really well, actually, really well. <laughs> I'm going to cheat because I've got, an, I've yeah, got a burning I, question. I sorry, I've just got a burning yeah, question. Fine, sorry, sorry. We also did the terrible, well, no, great idea, individual learning account, and then that, that was full of fraud, so that was a big problem. But, but I, I, the, I was really interested um, in, in how you'd get individuals also to, to recognise they had to put something in. So not just receive the opportunity of the training, but I'm very struck in Scandinavia as a kind of tripartite view of, of training through life, which is kind of government, industry and the individual are all coming together and saying we've got to keep retraining. So I think, it, how, would you, how would you make it clear that individuals themselves also had to contribute financially in a sense? Would that, I mean, I guess to the tax system, but would you, be, would you be explicit in that? Would you just be quiet about it? I mean, 
how would you how would you tackle that? Yeah, so there are, there are opportunities to offer tax breaks to those that invest in their own training, which is okay. something I identified in my proposal. Um, but also, I think it's about political will. The UK, at the moment, policy is in a lot of ways a negative subject because we're constantly kind of trying to deal with what we can, you know, just react to. Mm -hmm. This is about someone saying, setting forward a leader saying, this is a big national challenge that we have, but it's a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. And really highlighting this as, a, as something that we can all get behind, both left and right, from different perspectives, mm -hmm. and actually an opportunity for the country to come together to, to fix some of the biggest problems we have, but again, some of the biggest opportunities. So I think it's about political leadership, but I also recognise that by giving tax breaks to individuals, they can also add to their um, annual training allowance. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank Jennifer, you. Uh, Jennifer, for me, either of you yeah. want to... Very, very, very quick um, sort of start bridging style and substance point is a little bit similar to what I said before, but so, so it, it is a very compelling argument. Um, I, I just wonder, so these kinds of schemes are, are, are quite large and unwieldy to administer. They can be very costly and, and sometimes things break down. Why would it be better to take that 1% levy and give it to, uh, to a fund that would give everyone £1,000 than to tell businesses they had to spend 1% on bringing people in at different stages of their lives and careers and having some kind of mechanism for, for assessing that? Okay, so um, it's the, the, the secondary thing of asking businesses to do this um, is something that the, the government has been trying since the 90s. And, and in truth, if we, fail, if we don't actually... Make a, make, take action on this, we are going to fall massively behind. Mm -hmm. So I think it's actually, we, we don't have any more time mm -hmm. to ask businesses to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and in a lot of ways, businesses want the push. Mm -hmm. They want to be given the confidence. And, and a lot, one of the big problems is that we don't have capacity because there's not enough funding going into training. So a lot of the training is underdeveloped, night schools. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was a big input of cash, as I said, an expansion of training, then it would allow businesses to lower the cost of training for themselves as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. James, thank you Thanks. very much. James Bagley, everybody. Okay, uh, our next contestant is uh, Salome Gongadzi. Gongadzi uh, is in her second year of a politics degree, and for her proposal, tackling one of the wickedest issues uh, in contemporary Britain. Uh, Salome, you have three minutes to talk about housing within reach, reforms for tackling the British housing crisis. Your time starts now. Everybody in this room has been affected in some way by the British housing crisis. Firstly, house prices have exploded. Between 2000 and 2014, they rose twice as fast as average wages. Youngest people are the hardest hit. They spend much higher proportions of their average earnings on housing, and many never expect to be able to leave insecure, under-regulated private rental homes, which are perversely more expensive in the long term. We've had a serious drop-off in house building. We have fa consistently failed to hit national house building targets. Thirdly, we failed to provide enough housing for the worst off. 1.8 million families nationwide are on waiting lists for affordable social housing. Homelessness is rising while private landlords eat up billions in taxpayer-funded housing benefits every year. Housing is an increasingly urgent political issue as more and more people are affected by sky-high prices and spiraling rents. Government has shown that it is ready to act. I'm here with four policy recommendations that will deal with the crisis at its roots of under-delivery and unaffordability. Given that the housing shortage is spread out unevenly throughout England, government can selectively trial these changes in areas with the most need. So number one, a major barrier to speedy and affordable house building is the dominant speculative model of private house building, which incentivizes slow delivery and land hoarding to keep house prices high to recoup the extremely inflated cost of land. Meanwhile, some of our best developments, like the garden cities and new towns, were actually not built through speculative models, but through alternative civic house building methods. We should re-examine and possibly re-implement these methods to build new, genuinely affordable developments. Number two, ever since we stopped directly building affordable housing, many councils rely on requirements for developers to include a certain percentage of affordable units in new builds. Planning policy currently allows developers to actually negotiate these requirements if that they can demonstrate that they would be uh, detrimental to their profits. However, many experts suggest this policy is being abused, leading to even less affordable homes. We should amend policy to limit developers' ability to negotiate these requirements. Number three, civic house building and council housing needs a way to override the extremely inflated unearned cost of land. 
a uh, should amend policy around compulsory purchase orders. Currently, if government has to order, uh, purchase land, they have to uh, compensate landowners not based on the actual value of the land, but what it could be valued on if it was developed upon. We should develop a system in which land can be bought at something closer to its existing value. Lastly, we need to let councils uh, get, have the more control over their housing budgets by allowing them to borrow more money for, to build social housing directly. Currently, the current system imposes caps on council borrowing for house building purposes. In the words of one academic, housing and home are not just about bricks and mortar, but about identity, emotional security, and a sense of place in the world. Thank you. I think you've been practicing. It's uh, very good, very good indeed. Um, Funmi, do you want to have a start us off? Yeah, I, I, I think very, very spot on on a number of things. You're very, very relevant. You're talking about young people as well. Which one of these policy recommendations do you think will catapult young people to the center uh, stage of this <laughs> challenge and make things better for them? Um, so I think the thing about these recommendations is they basically, so the, the thing with young people, I think the biggest problem is basically saving up for a deposit for a house mm -hmm. takes a very long time. So for example, um, in the 1990s, it would take someone, uh, I think age 30, a uh, family to, uh, so they have to save up for three years for a deposit. The same amount of money is now 19 years of savings. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is you have to pull a few levers in terms of house prices to make that happen. So number one, you need to build more homes and oh, the, about the uh, civic house building and the requirements around developers, that's gonna increase supply, which should bring down costs as well. Um, as well, you know, obviously uh, in terms of, uh, I think housing benefit is being limited now for certain young people, so building more council homes is also gonna benefit them. So I think there is no one policy, uh, but I think anything that would sort of increase, uh, decrease costs would be a big one in terms of helping young people get on the housing ladder. So, so I, I wondered whether the last one in terms of uh, enabling councils to borrow uh, affordably might be something that speaks to this more than any of your uh, other I mean, to an extent, the, the thing is basically the point of that sort of fourth recommendation is basically mm. because we impose limits on how much councils can borrow to build social housing. Mm. And we don't impose limits on what they can borrow for commercial housing, so it doesn't really make sense to say, oh, it's about the debt, if they can actually borrow for mm. other stuff. Um, so what that would do is it would um, allow councils to take more money on to build more social rented housing, which can, you know, help provide young people who need that. Like that. Yeah. Thank you. Jennifer, do you want to have some thoughts on the, uh, on the presentation and, and substance, if you like? Uh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, well done. Really, really um, just brilliantly delivered. You, you clearly, clearly knew what you wanted to say and said it extremely clearly. Um, so, so that's just excellent. Um, I, I actually I, I wanted to applaud your use of recommendation one, two, three, and four. Mm. I'm sure we're supposed to do it in threes, but I think the four. The four. Just pushing the envelope. The four were all very, very strong. Mm. Um, I, I must say that, that it, I, I guess I wondered what you you had about a whole sentence, almost a little mini paragraph for each of them. If you were to sum up. The, each of those in, in just kind of a few words for each recommendation. What, it, it just to reel it up. You, what, what's the key thing? Just the, okay. the three words. Overcoming two speculative words. housing, um, making developers follow the law, mm -hmm. uh, change, uh, lowering house, uh, speculation on land, and uh, allowing councils to build more social housing. That was pretty damn good, actually. Yeah. 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 Any other, any other thoughts from the, from the judges? It's quite a mix between things that are quite interventionist in the market and then, uh, uh, and, and then things that sort of um, recognise the need for more uh, market building. I, I just wonder if, if there's any conflict that you've identified between some of these policies. Um, just no. because, so, for example, right? So, uh, when because the councils can lean on house builders to develop affordable housing, they don't really feel the need to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And actually, maybe we're just completely misguided to be asking the private sector to build the social housing in the first place. Yeah, I think that uh, I think there's probably a little bit of both. So, the the reason why we have that reliance on the private sector these days is because 
we they well they for any reasons but one of them is they can't borrow to build directly and so so I think you can't I, it would be kind of a transition or the transitionary period so you would basically uh, be kind of strengthening the laws around one requirement which is developers have to build uh, affordable housing as part of developments while also getting moving the idea that councils can start building again and maybe say five ten years on we can kind of reconfigure how we do stuff but at the moment I think a lot of these things kind of need to come together at once make that happen, yeah. Can I, can I ask one point? Am I allowed to do that? I think. <laughs> Just on, on, the, on the viability point, so you made the point that at the moment some private developers are not building the proportion of affordable homes they say at the outset because later on the viability of the project is reduced, the profits they can make and they, 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 they have to make 20%. Now, the, the, the counter argument to that is that we, we, we rely on private developers to build at least half if not more of the homes that we need. And it's a big risk for them. And if they don't have some kind of assurance up front that actually, do you know what, you're not going to lead us down a path and force us to make them all social housing and we actually lose all our, all our money, they're just not going to develop at all and they'll have no houses. Yeah, so, um, just to kind of, I don't mean to correct you, but there's sort of a few things about that. <laughs> in the, so, <laughs> works is that basically there's you have your uh, national planning policy and then you protect which every single locality makes their own local plan and then within that plan they say we want 10 percent 20 whatever and then uh, developers would um, submit a plan without them and they would say oh we would reject the plan then they come back with the viability say it's not viable what I said the, the big thing is that it's being systematically abused so for example Probably the most famous one was in Alfred and Castle, which is in London. They mm -hmm. had this estate, housing estate, which was, I think it had about 2,000 social rented homes on it. And basically what the developer did was, instead of developing the certain percentage they were supposed to, they submitted this viability assessment that was A, very secretive, so they submitted it, um, it wasn't public, it was very privately done. They would do things like they would undervalue the price of the homes they could sell. So they would say, oh, well, property in this area sells for X but they're looking at property that's not equivalent to the property they're actually going to be selling. They, for example, they um, overcharged for like, they said, oh, we're going to pay this much for materials. Didn't end up happening. And then the other thing that is systematic is they're paying too much for land. So yes, the two developers come in for the yeah. same plot and push the yeah, price up. But what if we do is if we say, you, you strengthen the requirement for affordable housing, now everyone's going to be paying less for the land because they're both they both know they have to follow this rule. So the idea is we're actually kind of kind of cool down the inflation on the land prices by doing this. I think that's part of the idea, yeah. If you can sort that out, you have really <laughs> solved the big one. So there we go. Thank you very much indeed. So now we are halfway through our 10 uh, policy idol hopefuls. So I do hope you've been making uh, a note and you've got, uh, you've got detailed notes on everyone ahead of your big vote for the audience award. Uh, number six on the list, Nicholas Seidman. Uh, Nicholas is in the third year of a war studies course and wants to tell us about preventing humanitarian atrocities with low cost cameras. You have three minutes on that, Nicholas, start. Oppressive governments around the world are committing humanitarian atrocities. By hiding them from public view, they can avoid accountability. In Myanmar, the government is allegedly committing ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya people. The UN estimates that over 6,000 people have been killed by state security forces, and another 800,000 have fled to Bangladesh out of fear of further persecution. When UN investigators were sent to verify these claims of abuse, they were barred from entry. With no verification, the government goes unpunished. Now, this is not an isolated incident. The Saudi government is the top perpetrator of civilian casualties in the Yemen war. Yet, by imposing a media blackout and preventing further foreign journalists from entering, these abuses cannot be verified. With no verification, another government goes unpunished. So, how can we gather evidence to hold these governments accountable? My policy is to send low-cost video cameras to victims of humanitarian atrocities, allowing them to film the government's crimes and hold them accountable. Now, this will be achieved through two stages. The first stage is to use small drones to send low-cost cameras to victims in these affected areas. Now, the exact model of drone above me is already in use, providing medical supplies to remote villages in Rwanda. Made with durable components, this can be used to drop dozens of video cameras at a time in these affected areas, allowing for crucial footage of abuses to be collected. 
The footage will then be uploaded to balloon-powered internet. Think of them as weather balloons, but capable of providing internet connectivity to remote parts of the globe. They successfully reconnected 100,000 Puerto Ricans after Hurricane Maria hit the island. These will be sent over the affected areas, allowing for footage to be collected, automatically connecting the cameras, and uploaded, and showing to the world the reality on the ground. Now the footage will begin to tell a story, one that was lost by us not accessing it, finally providing the international community the evidence it needs to hold these governments accountable. But how viable is this option? Well, for starters, it can't be shot down. Both the drones are too small and the balloons fly at too high of an altitude for missiles to reach. This ensures that oppressive governments can prevent the footage from being collected and uploaded. Secondly, it's cost effective. The overall cost of the project is about half, less, less than half a million pounds. Now the UK has already pledged 59 million pounds to Rohingya crisis and 50 million pounds to the Yemenese crisis. This project represents less than 1% of those funds. And finally, it will be easy to coordinate on the ground with civilians in these affected areas. The World Bank estimates that nearly 5 billion people in developing areas in the developing world have access to mobile subscriptions, making communication easier than ever. Now, we know in the past that this has worked. In 2013, the Syrian government dropped chemical weapons on innocent civilians. The only evidence that we know of this happening is because witnesses on the ground took footage with their cameras. After re reaching the mass media, they were able to show the abuse that happened. UN uh, Assad was forced to allow these UN investigators inside, ultimately destroying these chemical weapons, holding the government accountable, and preventing further use of chemical weapons against civilians. Now, with numerous NGOs willing to help the less fortunate, and now the means to do so, it's no longer a question of how, but a question of when. Thank you. Well, uh, Nicholas, uh, another very good one. Very nice picture of you there as well. <laughs> um, yes, uh, Sally. I think this is a fantastic idea, actually. I think it's really, really inspirational. Um, I'm intrigued as to why it's got to be cameras rather than, you know, if, if so many people now have smartphones, why an alternative isn't, isn't using that? Uh, and is that batteries or, I don't know, it, that was one question. And secondly, did you say, because one of my initial questions was, um, was wouldn't the balloon be um, in danger? But you were saying, am I, am I clear that that's, yeah. that's above the range where the, the enemy, yeah. if you like, where, could, could, and, could yeah, get it? Ground, um, well, just on the first point, so mobile yeah. phones. Um, are, you, are you talking about allowing them to use their phones or, or recent phones? Or dropping. Why choosing cameras ah. rather than smartphones on the basis that so many people now, even in quite remote areas, are used to using phones? So yeah. could we not find a way of, 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 of recognising that and using that mechanism um, in the same way? So the thing with sending mobile phones was that we can't be sure that they'll be used for actually filming. What might happen is they could easily be sold and for okay. money because we know they actually cost quite a lot in developing and develop, um, developing an underdeveloped world. So we know that we're for sure that if we send cameras, they'll have one function and one function only, which is to film the atrocities mm -hmm. that are occurring. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we know that in these areas, just providing internet won't be sufficient because, like I said, even though few that have smartphones, they're low quality, and they're just so limited to the population, it won't find enough evidence. Okay, so, okay. thank you. Um, but how, well, long, yeah. how long does the battery last on one of these? Right, so um, they only really turn on when they're actually clicked and used, meaning that they actually have a battery life of hours upon hours. Meaning that, obviously, these atrocities will if they're in the war zone themselves, will only last ideally a few moments. But if they occur on multiple scales, the battery life will last long enough. But with this, in, there will be a continuous stream of these cameras being uh, sent into these affected areas. So even if one runs out of battery, it won't be, it won't lack a supply. There'll be a continuous supply. Funny, I want to give you a come in on this. Yes, yes. Uh, well, thank you. Very, very interesting indeed. Uh, but to, to Quick questions. Of course, uh, you're suggesting that there's no evidence today to hold governments into account. Uh, and yet we know that there's sufficient evidence anyway to hold governments to account. So how will this be different, even if you gathered all of that? Well, for example, what we know is about in the Rohingya um, example, since um, independent, independent verifiers, the media, and everything can't actually get access to the Rohingya state, all we have are testimonies of the people that were actually there to actually hold the government accountable. So we know what's happening, but we can't have a substantial proof to actually either stop enough sanctions on them, uh, make 
does the leadership of ICC before the courts. So what this will provide, as was the example in the CV example, is that we'll, it'll provide evidence to the point in which the government can legitimately not, can't deny that these events are occurring. Right now, the, the Burmese government can deny. Mm. In the case of Syria, mm. the government possibly cannot deny. Mm which is what compelled the UN, EU, and the US to send in new investigators. Okay, well, interesting. Very quickly, now if you look at those who commit to the use of drones, you mentioned Rwanda. Uh, for example, Rwanda was already using drones to deliver health uh, aid to remote areas. So that government is committed to doing that. When we're dealing with governments that will not give resources to such a thing because it means that they're holding themselves, they, we're asking them to hold themselves accountable. Which agency, which government or agency of uh, the United Nations do you think can spend this? Well, for example, in Rwanda right now, it's actually an NGO who's doing it. So it's an NGO that's actually operating uh, mm. in uh, Rwanda. What we know now is that NGOs are compelled or feel compelled to actually send uh, find a way in order to gather this evidence of occurring. So it would really be the NGOs that will be spearheading the project. Now obviously um, governments can fund to a certain extent through the NGOs uh, these funds. As we know, governments give funds yearly or annually to NGOs. So the way they Thank you. Yeah, any you're happy. No, I'm happy. I've Ready got one, tiny, one yeah. tiny point, actually. It's not really a question, oh. but on substance, mm. I thought the one tiny thing that you could have, could have used was the power of pictures. And mm. you're young, but a lot of us in the, this room will remember the power of you know, the, the, the Agent Orange pictures mm. or Biafra. I mean, those, just that sort of, that's just amazing, amazing picture. And that's what this would give you, I think. Yeah. I, and in terms of yeah. selling it to policymakers, I, I think it would be very, you know, you can use, you can use historical examples of pictures, I think. Could I, could I just ask one thing on the pictures? Yeah. Um, obviously, we were talking about evidence that this is going to appear in a, in a court someday. Will, will, will the pictures be, you know, imprinted with a date and a yeah. time on them? Do they actually yeah, will know exactly where they were taken and when? Well, since we know, since they're only going to be using the cameras they provide them, and they're going to be uploaded to only the balloons that we have um, in use, they will obviously have only one way in which so they we'll could possibly have We we'll know exactly the time, we we'll know the location because it will be uploaded, we we'll know all the information because we're going to be the ones controlling it. It won't be the government. I have one, one awful yeah. question oh, yeah. then from that. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible one, so, so yeah. do shoot me down. But um, so how do we know that there won't be unintended consequences of people staging things that look like horrible atrocities in order to be persuasive? Uh, well, I mean, for example, the case in Yemen, which would be airstrikes that would be trying to prevent, it would be really hard to, for example, recreate airstrikes. Mm -hmm. um, but the chemical weapons, chemical weapons, that was actually one of the, um, one of the critiques when footage stopped coming out. People mm -hmm. called it staged. But because of the overwhelming evidence of both the people, the different angles in which it was coming from, the, since mm -hmm. there was just so much footage, it was really hard for people who at the beginning critiqued it for saying it was staged, but then after uh, said that, Due to the overwhelming evidence, the veracity of it was compelling. So you think some forensic videography or something could, could discern? Yeah, if needed. Okay. But if you wind up with footage depicting the same story, it will be difficult mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. sort of yeah. deny yeah. that this That's story is untrue. Well done. Mm. It's a really intriguing idea. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Ian. Nicholas Seidman. Thank you. Uh, and um, if you haven't filled out your what policy idea would change the world, you've had a lot of inspiration by now. Really, you should have come up with something. Uh, there will be people popping around to make sure we pick them all up and they'll be transferred into some uh, Freudian nightmare uh, or dream over there. That'd be marvellous. Uh, right, the next three minutes belong to Xia Ying Su, who's studying for a Master's in Neuroscience. The title, do come up. Uh, the title is intriguing. It takes a village towards a holistic approach to bullying in schools. <laughs> Xia Ying, your 180 seconds start on that subject. Now, tonight I'm going to tell you why we need to fundamentally rethink our approach to bullying prevention. But first, you might say, we have so many problems on hand. Why bullying? For starters, bullying costs taxpayers dollars. A 2017 study found that for every one pound spent on an anti-bullying program, the return was one pound fifty. So, why is a new approach needed? 
For starters, current approaches are mostly reactive. As we can see from the awareness program, which is the current gold standard in bullying prevention, there is an urgent need for a holistic approach to bullying prevention. Other than reducing bullying behaviour, given the power imbalance that underlies bullying, it's important that we empower individuals so they are less likely to become victims. For those who are bullied, it's important that we mitigate the negative impact. A good place to start would be to look at the risk factors associated with bullying, such as maltreatment, as well as the factors associated with mitigating negative outcomes in victims, such as resilience. Because bullying is associated with multiple factors, including mental health, we cannot formulate bullying policy in isolation. In addition, given that bullying is often at its worst during primary school, it's important that efforts begin prior to the start of formal education. My proposal comprises two parts. First, in addition to moral education, I propose that preschool curriculum should include teaching empathy, resilience, and self-esteem, as well as have dedicated sessions on bullying. This may include talking about things like what constitutes bullying behaviour. Next, we need to ensure that every school has a trained counsellor that can provide support to at-risk students and their families. As of 2016, only 52% of primary schools in the UK offer counselling services. But how exactly will we operationalise this? First, just as how the government currently has an advisory council for drug prevention, I propose that we establish one for bullying which will provide recommendations on how to design effective programs. It will comprise of educators, researchers, mental health professionals, um, as well as policy makers. Next, based on these recommendations, the curriculum and bullying guidelines issued to schools can be expanded. Finally, we can piggyback on existing structures. The government has already promised to commit over £1.4 billion for youth mental health and bullying has been identified as a target in this plan. A recent Green Paper has proposed to have a senior mental health lead in every school by 2023. To conclude, will my proposal eradicate bullying? Definitely not. This is barely the tip of the iceberg. But just as how Rome was not built in a day, we need um, time to build comprehensive um, bullying policy and we can start by laying the first brick. Thank you. As luck would have it, we have the former head of the uh, school's inspectorate who knows rather a lot about bullying on the panel. But I'm not. I'm going to come to uh, uh, Polly first of all uh, to, to, to talk about the substance. Um, so I, I just wonder if this, if this really is something that should be controlled from a national level, or if it's actually something that would be more successfully driven by innovative approaches and much more flexibility for head teachers. I think that is definitely a good question. I think there's always um, a lot of debate over whether or not a top-down approach is um, necessarily the best. I think currently in the UK, how it is, is that um, each school decides on their own like bullying policy and like, how they deal with mental health, which is not a bad thing because every school has different needs. They have different makeups of students and so on. But I think there is definitely need for um, bringing in more um, research-based recommendations because I, I think currently maybe teachers don't necessarily know what is the right approach and um, providing some guidance from above might be a good thing. Okay, uh, Sally? I, I, I'm sort of interested really in, in where students fit into this because I think the I think one of the things that, that, that tends to work if you at the school level is listening to the students and helping and making sure that they're helping design yes. um, and in a sense outing bullying. How would that fit, how would students fit into to, to the sort of national structure you're describing? So uh, one way would be, um, I mentioned that um, we will establish the um, bullying advisory council and basically this council will include like voices from both like the policy maker as well as the educator standpoint. So one way that could happen would be that the educators can feed back like, um, um, the views of the students and one of the ways how the views of the students could be um, elicited would be through the um, senior mental health lead 
that um, has been, um, that will be in every school hopefully by 2023 because um, that lead will basically oversee um, mental health issues in the school and bullying is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, re really interesting. Obviously, I think it would be very hard to argue that this isn't a problem that we should tackle. So well done for, for raising its profile here. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm intrigued by the title that we've got there, um, uh, which is actually quite a psychological and behavioral one. Um, and, and actually, that was one of the things I thought was uh, not so prominent in your, your descriptions are about a council and guidelines and so on. But actually, we know that some of the challenges and the dynamics of bullying are that it's very hard to report, there's a real stigma attached mm -hmm. to snitching, um, that other people might want, not want to go forward either, that even the teachers might be afraid of the students who they would have to report on. So, so how, how do you get past some of those real behavioral and psychological challenges? That's a good question. Um, the reason why it doesn't match is because I changed my titles. <laughs> <laughs> That's honest. So, uh, I, I kind of changed the perspective in terms of like the angle of my pitch. So you are right that uh, my proposal did not really touch on the psychological perspective, but that's a really good point you um, um, brought up. I think one of the reasons why I came up with this title to begin with is to kind of draw attention to the idea that we need to look a bit more upstream mm -hmm. when we talk about bullying prevention. And research has really told us a lot in terms of like what are some of like, the motivations for bullying, like such as like why bullies get a kick out of bullying. I think there are some uh, good neuroscience mm -hmm. studies um, on like reward circuits and things like that. So um, that's actually um, a good place to start. And in terms of drawing back to my um, current proposal, I think um, setting up that um, research council would be really good in terms of like drawing in um, the views of like researchers and being plugged in into like current research. For, for me, I, I should have come to you actually earlier, but just on the on the style and presentation, what what, what what thoughts on that? No, no. I I, I mean I thought. You you were very relaxed, you came in, you know, seemed to have command of your subject. Uh, but I'm just very curious as well, just one quick thing on challenges. Well, what, what do you think, don't you think there might be a bit of pushback at the national level to the idea of having uh, a national level council? What, what other issue might this be competing with the most, do you think? When it comes to schools, uh, for example. That is a good question. I, I think um, as I um, open my presentation, I mean, we have so many problems on hand. We have so few resources. Like the, the million dollar question is why should we channel our time and resources to do bullying? And um, I mean, you asked, like, you know, will there be any pushback to a national level um, initiative that might be? But I, I think it's for us to really put forth the case that is an important issue. As for what other um, uh, um, issues at the school level that it might be competing with. I mean, for starters, I can think of like mental health, but that's the thing that um, my proposal puts forward is that we need to start thinking about bullying in terms of associations. Like, we cannot think about it in isolation. And once we think about bullying as part of like a larger ecosystem, we will realize that actually it's not competing with other things, but by stepping up efforts in areas like mental health, we can actually help bullying. So I think it's not looking mm -hmm. at it as a zero-sum game, but really to get the message out there that um, it's part of a larger ecosystem and we can kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> very, very, a very confident uh, for us to, It's a very good strategy to tell the judges what brilliant questions they've asked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, see how you soon. <laughs> So our eighth pitch comes from a double act, ladies and gentlemen, uh, both first years. Sam Clare is studying politics and Alexa Dewar is doing uh, PPE. Uh, they still only get three minutes, I'm afraid, even though there's <laughs> two of you. Uh, three minutes to explain what they mean by empowering every child, starting now. Please. A couple of months ago, Sam and I were sitting in the auditorium of Bush House attending a lecture on political culture where we heard something that we haven't been able to shake since. And I'm pretty sure that tonight we're going to shake you too. 7% of the British population attend a private school. And yet, on average, 60% of those in top paid professions are privately educated. This timeless inequality that's affected our parents and will continue to affect our children begins with the education system that we all have to pass through. So this has got to change. We want to tackle this head-on with a three-stage chronological policy. 
empowering every child in Britain to achieve the best they can in life, no matter where they come from. Step one, quality and sound career advice. Since the introduction of the Education Act in 2011, there's virtually no obligation to give careers advice in secondary schools. Statutory guidance on careers advice is described as weak by Engineering UK, but our children deserve far more than weak. We want to create legislation that puts an obligation on teachers to give careers advice in secondary schools that is quality and sound. In addition, we want to incentivise businesses and charities to come into schools and offer their experience and guidance. This is relatively low cost and vital in getting those from less advantaged backgrounds inspired. Step two, fair and forgiving grade requirements. Students from poorer backgrounds get consistently lower grades than their rich counterparts. On average, it is two grades lower per GCSE subject. Therefore, grades should be contextualised to the backgrounds that these children come from to compensate for the difficulties that they may face in life. Now, this can be achieved through legislation, placing a requirement on universities to actually contextualise their admission services. And this is not a problem because <laughs> um, evidence actually shows that those that come from a state school background do better than their privately educated counterparts when they get to university, suggesting that if the grade boundaries were slightly altered, we would still do really well. <laughs> Step three, to end unpaid internships for good. The Sutton Trust, Internaware, and the Institute for Public Policy Research all reiterate poor individuals are missing out on jobs because they cannot <laughs> afford to work for free. We want to create legislation. We want to create legislation <laughs> and a whistleblowing scheme that reveals the guises that unpaid internships hide under and finally end this exploitative process which benefits only those whose parents can actually afford to fund them. Now, we know this isn't an issue that can be solved overnight or even just with our policy, but I know that I can speak for both Sam and myself when I say that we hope that the generation of students to pass through Bush House in the, the next time um, will not hear statistics that are as stark as the ones that we heard a couple of months ago. And I hope we didn't shake you too much. Thank you. <laughs> that was, uh, was literally about to go, so uh, that is very, very impressive on the timing. Polly, you come in. Uh, I thought that was excellent. I love your, your passion and enthusiasm. Um, it's actually something I've spent a lot of time when I was in government mm -hmm. stressing about um, is careers advice mm -hmm. uh, and how, <laughs> in fact, to do what you've set out, which is to provide good quality careers advice in schools because how exactly because you've got a bunch of teachers and they know really lots of stuff about teaching they don't necessarily know anything about careers how do you square that circle of course um, there are resources in place so, um, there are websites with all these resources on. it's just actually getting the teachers to spread the message to the children and tell them to, to look in these places like there are, like, there are a lot of like websites and stuff like the internet is around with careers advice on but children aren't looking, the teachers don't know where to tell them to look and um, the reason that we came up with the policy was, I mean, it's, it's like anecdotal evidence, but we went to state schools and it was like, pretty terrible, it was like, join the army or, you know, do, do something like, be a yeah. plumber. Yeah. So I, I went to eight different schools and trust me, careers advice is really, really bad in the private sector and the public sector, yeah. everywhere you go. There isn't any good advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, I'm just, I'm kind of... I, Pointing people to a website doesn't really feel like a transformational yeah. policy to me. Um, we, we thought about um, teachers learning this through their PGC studies, so like um, you know they can be part of the course whilst they're at university. Um, they can learn the skills that they, they need to pass on to the children. So um, well, I, I think as well, it's about finding. You know, if, if all teachers are qualified technically to be able to give this advice, it's also about the children having a connection with hopefully one of their teachers and then that teacher being able to open up several doors for them because I remember being at school, you know, I in specific connected with one person and luckily she's probably got me to where I am today. Otherwise, it's very hard to have that motivation, you know, to go out there and find out everything yourself because it's so daunting. So hopefully that could be a, a bridge maybe to the, to the end goal of... Amazing career advice everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Sally? I'm supposed to do style, aren't I? But I'll do a bit of both. I mean, I thought, um, 
actually, I thought the style was great because I thought it was really punchy, and I loved the fact that. I mean, you know, I could argue with the recommendations. I could have come up with different ones, but the fact that you were really clear and it was a one, two, three, and you'd focus properly on on several things, I thought was really good. Um, I mean, like Polly, I'm sceptical. I'm sceptical through bitter experience on the careers advice one, um, and I think one of the things that you know could be worth you thinking about is how you go beyond teachers because in a sense always expecting to be teachers I think is a bit tough and you know one of the things that I was interested in various points at looking at is could it be a role could somebody on the governing body have a particular role I think we've got to find ways of being more creative yeah. and going into the sort of wider community around the school mm. to, to get them to help but I think you you know I think you you focused properly on on, on some of the the key concerns that do that we need to change to shift the dial, um, and I have a particular, a particular interest in the internships one because my eldest son set up Intern Aware, so I've lived with that for oh, many wow. years. <laughs> But I mean, it's, it's it, you know that's that is it's a small, discreet policy. And you're right that sometimes relatively small things, by shining the light and being really, really clear, has an effect. So I think you're you're right to shine the light. Thank you. It is again one of those really wicked issues yeah. of, of the other contemporary uh, period. So mm. Jennifer, just your thoughts on on that? Because on that, there's you know it's it's familiar ground. Mm. Uh, did you feel there was there was something new in that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very new. I think it's. Um, I, I think in the civil service they use the word bold sometimes to, to say. Um, so because the evidence base that I know, which is um, which is uh, uh, for different policies, would say that actually, if you want to achieve the things you've set out, closing the educational attainment gap, for example, uh, teaching philosophy in schools for an hour or two a week at any school, um, helps close that gap that opens between socioeconomic groups uh, over the course of a summer, for example. And so, so that, for instance, as, as one possible one. And then also putting it in the context of we're in, a, we're in an environment where um, you talked about 60% of professionals come from private schools. Well, actually, professions are about to dramatically change. Mm. And I guess one could argue maybe, maybe uh, another way of approaching this would be to teach coding and make sure that um, the kids in, in, in yeah. schools you're talking about um, can, can come in and take over the world by, by uh, having, <laughs> having mastered what the, new, what the new skills will need to be. Yeah. So I just wondered yeah. about some of those alternatives evidence bases that, that might achieve some of the things mm. you're talking about. I think that's really interesting about the whole idea that the professions are going to change because, well, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Mm. Um, but I wonder how much will, I mean, unless we do something, unless we intervene, how much will, you know, the socio-economic kind of dynamics that form around the top paid professions mm. change as well? Because, mm. you know, it's likely that I don't know, with, with the system we've got, it's just going to move into I'll different top people. Oh, exactly, yeah, exactly. So, um, mm. we will, you know, mm. if you hit at the right time, I'm sure, I'm sure it would hopefully change things, yeah. I think we somewhat, like, touched upon that um, in your conclusion there. So, we're like, it's just like the tip of the iceberg, like, obviously, yeah. it's such a big problem that we're just, like, you know, trying to do a little bit so that... Yeah. We had a yeah. meeting with um, Michael Bennett from the Policy Institute last week, and we ended up literally just speaking for two hours I mean, kind of going round in circles because obviously there's no conclusion to this, but it was just so interesting because it's it's so such much. a dynamic and never-ending topic. Yeah. Well done. Really <laughs> thank done. you. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you both very much indeed, Alexa. Well, I'm told that we have a a celebrity in the in the audience tonight. In fact, the the winner of Policy Idol 2017, Louis wow. Phelps, is in the room. Uh, Louis, would you like to make yourself known? <laughs> okay, there. Excellent. Uh, so uh, I, I, hope I hope you're impressed uh, by what you've seen today. Um, right, the end is in sight, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We've had uh, eight down, two to go. So our ninth policy idol contestant, uh, Daniela, I'm going to say this wrong. How do you say your surname? Daniela Villegreses. That's the one. Uh, who is uh, in the second year of a political economy degree. Her proposal is called Shaping the Future of Latin America. Daniela, you have three minutes on that subject, starting now. Ladies and gentlemen, let's tackle an issue that hinders the development of Latin America, corruption. The abuse of entrusted power or public funds for private gain often misallocates resources devoted to social services and development projects. It also discourages investment and jeopardizes the public trust in political institutions. This is Latin America. All countries except three exhibit from medium to high levels of corruption. 
these levels are higher than expected, considering the region's level of economic development. And despite major structural and constitutional anti-corruption reforms in every country since the early 1990s, little or no change has been visible over the last 17 years. So why? Why does nothing work? Take, for instance, the scandal of Odebrecht just last year. The reason why the Ecuadorian vice president and two former Peruvian presidents, among others, have been sentenced to jail. In response, countries have launched a new wave of anti-corruption reform to shape the government and public institutions. These reforms since the early 90s have been proven effective because both society and public officials undermine new regulations. Here, corruption is endemic. So the missing piece towards a solution is to also target society. I propose to implement compulsory education in good citizenship and values by following the guidelines of preventing through education in Latin America, which already implemented sexual education into school curriculums. Results will be visible in the short, medium, and long run. In the short run, a student's new perception of what is right and wrong will change their behavior. This automatic adjustment has already been visible in other value-based programs. For example, your moment of truth in Kenya. After one year of education in value to tackle harassment against women, more than 70% of boys who witnessed physical or sexual assault successfully intervened to stop it. After, students will go to their homes, changing social norms. Citizens will become less willing to participate in police or bureaucratic bribery due to its increasing social disapproval. The idea is that if I am accountable, I want you to be accountable. This attitude will be enforced, and demands for more transparent public institutions will increase. Finally, our new generation of political leaders will be studying in the system, and once they get into power, they will be tackling other issues while keeping the system clean. Perhaps, if we foster more honest societies, Latin America will finally deserve more transparent governments that actually work for the people. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Funmi, I think this might be right up your street. Yes. Um, I saw your example about, I saw this, the, what you alluded to Kenya They are Very interesting because, of course, it's, this is not just uh, a challenge in Latin America. Uh, it's in much of the developing world. And I wonder whether there isn't something to be said about structural change. There's something institutionalized that uh, gets us to that, that sustains corruption in a sense. So teaching this in schools in particular ways, uh, changing behavior at lower levels, if the, institution, uh, if the institutions don't change fundamentally, how will that lead to the kind of change you're talking about? The political system. All this stru the structural system reflect the people. So if the people is corrupt and has this kind of culture that support corruption and see like something normal and actually support corruption, it's quite difficult that the institutions are going to be clean. The thing is, Latin America has been constantly changing regulations, changing the, go the governments, and changing the, all, all the institutions. But they never focus on the people. People that is corrupt always find a way around all kinds of regulations. People will st still support bribery, even if there are strict laws against it. So that is the way. We change the people, and then the, stru the structure and the institutions are going to reflect the new society, the new social norm. One more thing. No, thank you. I know you're dealing with a very complex issue. It's very, very complex. I understand that. Is there a difference in your mind between behavioral change and attitudinal change if we're dealing with, if we're talking about changing the people. Is there a difference? I would say that isn't the show wrong. The show wrong is behavior. Mm -hmm. It's just the impact of telling people something that is wrong that they used to think that was right or normal. And then the attitude change in the medium wrong. is when mm -hmm. people start in, in, in group, start to think perhaps that is not right. So the attitude, the social norms start to change, and that is the attitude towards the issue. Mm -hmm. So that is the difference that I can grasp. That. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I actually thought that was 
brilliantly presented, really authoritative, passionate, good use of tone, good use of movement, and a little bit of arm movement, but no waving and flailing. It was really, it was just, it was really no, nicely wa wa done. Waving and flailing. Waving and flailing. <laughs> 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 it, was, um, it, it was just very persuasive from, from, from that uh, perspective. I, I, I do have a question about, so you're talking really about ground up changing of norms and, and behaviors of the population. Um, yeah. Uh, so, from, I, I know probably not as much about this as you, but I do know that Estonia seems to be one of the countries that's done a pretty good job of tackling corruption, Estonia. And one of the things that, that um, the argument goes was really necessary there was, uh, yes, people had to want change, but actually they had to basically remove a whole generation mm. of political leaders who were, were, for whom you know, the, the corrupt practices were so deeply ingrained that actually any new people coming up asking for change were just going to hit... Uh, you know, find themselves between a rock and a hard place, or hit a, hit a brick wall, if the analogy goes. Um, and and the, the risk, I suppose, is if you're educating a whole generation of young people to come up into mm. a system that's going to, going to beat them back down, actually mm. it could be a recipe for, for less progress, more social unrest, more unhappiness. And so how, how do you tackle the, the kind of the risk of, of that top, top down bit not changing when the bottom up is? Uh, yes, the, this is a bottom-up solution, so if we start in the society, I do think that it's progressional and systematic. I don't think that these new people is going to find such, such kind of cap of people like trying to push them down. That, I don't think that it's going to happen because it's much the, some politicians are corrupt, not all of them, but it's mostly because it's accepted. It's, Okay, this person is corrupt, and if this is not, nothing related with your money, is oh, if he was so intelligent, he did it because he was hiding this kind of corruption from others for a long time. So it's quite admired. So I don't think that when they, the, when the new politician and the new generation of political leaders go into power, they are going to find this gap because the institution will have changed. It's the importance of the middle round. It's important that the acceptance of the people and the criminalization of corruption have increased. So people is demanding clean institutions. People is demanding government that actually represents them, a clean society. So that is my idea about the policy. I'm very struck. I think, I think I don't know what you're thinking about doing next, but it just it strikes me it needs it also needs it also needs people who are brave enough to go out there and talk and be confident. And I think that you know your presentation was was really strong and confident. Um, and I, I wonder. I mean, it's in the sense of picking up what, what, what Jen just said. I mean, I, I wonder to what extent it, it needs a break and a completely new generation mm -hmm. who have indeed been developed and educated and and thought about it in the way you're describing, but but almost need to come in as a group to. to to, to take the idea forward. I think that is necessary. I mean, this change, I am, I am presenting right now a change that I think that it should, be, it should be done. Because there are a lot of kind of solutions that we have tried, we have tried everything mm -hmm. in institutional mm -hmm. level. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. this is a new generation, this is the change that, this is the piece that was missing. That uh, the last week in the economic forum, for the very first time, there was an article about how to tackle corruption with technology and education. This kind of new ideas is quite amazing how people is, is, people is starting to see new kind of ways to tackle this problem because it's a huge issue. Mm. Well, I think we, no one could deny that we're tackling the big issues tonight. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Daniela. <laughs> Tonight comes from a fourth-year dental student. Good teeth, Ross. Yeah, Ross Hills. Uh, and Ross is using his knowledge of teeth uh, to propose water fluoridation, tackling tooth decay one drop at a time. Um, Ross, you have the last three minutes of Policy Idol 2018. Your time starts now. Despite dental, de dental decay being an entirely preventable disease, we're a nation of children with rotten mouths. One in four of our children start school with dental decay. General anesthesia of tooth extractions is the number one reason for hospital admissions in five to nine year olds. And it's an average cost of 836 pounds per tooth. Now, aside from the cost burden, we've got little Sally being scared of the dentist all her life. Little Polly missing three days on average from school. <laughs> little Fun Me having pain driven sleepless nights 
<laughs> and little Jennifer having eating and sleeping problems throughout her childhood. <laughs> the list does go on, but I'm out of judges. <laughs> For it on the tooth, I spit like a layer of super glue. It hardens the outer enamel surface, making a more resistant acid attack, preventing cavities from forming. And like super glue, though, fluoride is naturally found in water. So in a nutshell, water fluoridation is the raising of fluoride levels to an optimal one parts million number. So when we drink it from the tap, we get the decay fighting benefits. This is where we're at right now. Lucky Brits living in the light blue areas already live in locations where when they drink water from the tap, fluoride is naturally at that one parts million level. So they don't need to do anything. Unfortunately, most of the UK drink it at the 0.2 level, and it just isn't enough to give any sustained health benefits. Game changer, innovative local health authorities covering 6 million of the Navy Brits have already taken the decision to raise fluoride from the 0.2 to the one parts million level. And when we compare the white and blue, we see a 20% reduction in decay in five-year-olds and a massive 45% reduction in hospital admissions because of this decay. So we know it works. Fluoridation isn't expensive either. Public health England costed it at less than 50 pence per person per year. And over a lifetime, that's less than the cost of one filling. I'll put another way for every one pound we invest a day, we'll save 12 pounds 71 within just five years, making it by far the most cost-effective decay prevention program that we have. Now, for, tooth decay obviously isn't endemic to the UK, and when we look across the world, many countries have already taken steps to add fluoride to their water. On this map, the more intense the red, the more people in that country are drinking fluoride at beneficial levels. In fact, it's been so successful across the pond, the US Centre for Disease Controls listed it in the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century. Now, we know what you're thinking, Ross, if it's so good, why haven't we done it nationally already? Well, firstly, the most recent legislation put the onus of deciding to fluoridate on individual local authorities. On a practical basis, water pipes don't abide by authority boundaries, and getting neighbours to grow on anything is never easy. Secondly, decay has not suffered equally. The most deprived areas see severe decay at six times that of the least, and if the problem's not happening in your backyard, you're less likely to pay attention. And finally, it's only recently we've reached a stage of epidemic proportions with a 20% increase in these hospital admissions in just four years. So ladies and gentlemen, I finish with this. I hope you're thirsty for change. It's time we fluoridate the water we drink. It's time we tackle the tooth decay problem. Thank you. compelling the stats are very compelling and very scary actually mm. I suppose my question is how how do you get the public and policymakers mm. to make to make the choice because it's one thing it's one thing proving things and taking things away from people so you know smoking controls were had, are hard enough to do and I remember it well but but that was stopping something but putting something into food or water has always been controversial um, and you know you can talk about folic acid or it could be it, it could be vitamin D. I mean, the, the conversations go on and go on and go on along yeah. the years. How do we convince people it's the time to make this decision? Absolutely, and this is the big question of the whole debate. I would say we're not necessarily adding something new into it. What I'm advocating is saying, look, look in Hartlepool, it naturally occurs at around the one parts million level. We can see the benefits they get there. Let's extend what's natural in Hartlepool and extend it across the country so we all get the benefits. So why, why haven't people accepted that up to now? Um... I think there's a bit of political fatigue, I think there's a bit of laziness. The most recent legislation, like I said, brought on individual authorities, and they kind of kicked it into the long grass. I think people, if you go to Birmingham, and you say, you know, do you mind Freud, do you mind this, do you mind that? There's no ma national kind of, there's no big debate happening in Birmingham whether they like it or not. They accept the benefits. A bit like seatbelts, when they tried to first introduce having, making it legal to have seatbelts, people say, oh, you know, I don't want this, like, mm. why should I have to put a seatbelt on? But now people just accept it. Okay. okay, Polly. Are there any other kind of mass medications that you'd advocate? Do you know what? I think medications are slightly misnomer. Um, Fry is not necessarily a synthetic drug that someone's built up in the lab. It's like a naturally occurring mineral. However, if you came back to me and you said, look, Ross, I've got this medication, Medication X. It's been trialled in so many other countries across the world. In the US, they've been putting it in the water for 70 years. They've got a lifetime of data. It's one of the most investigated things in dentistry right now. 
and they've not found any side effects. If you came to me and said, this drug X, used across the world, cost effective, proven to work, lifetime of data, I'd say let's have a level-headed debate about it, maybe. Because, yeah. I mean, in the US, also mm. they put vitamin mm. D in milk, mm. yeah. um, mm. whereas here we give it away in pharmacies yeah. and yeah. get no uptake. Yeah. So you, the reason perhaps that you... what we need is just a kind of comprehensive public mm. health mass drugging approach. <laughs> I'm sure if we all took <laughs> various pharmaceuticals, we'd do yeah. well on the gross national happiness. <laughs> <laughs> I think if, you, if all of the drugs have the same evidence that fluoride does, then I think you know, there's another debate to be had. Um, you say, well, why don't we give it out, like in this country, we give vitamin D out in pharmacies and whatnot. Um, we've been trying so many different ways in terms of child's dental health to improve the dental health of the nation, and it's not particularly working that well. If you put it in the water, you don't need to change any habits. You know, you're not teaching people to brush. You're not getting them to use new supplements or anything like that. People naturally drink water, and that's one of the reasons why water fluoridation is so good. Is the, is the difficulty that, that, that water is like a kind of fundamental, mm. and the idea that the state is kind of interfering with that, feel, a lot of people feel very uncomfortable about that. You've got quite a big job on, I think, to convince yeah. everybody. Yeah, absolutely. It is a big job, but just because it's a big job shouldn't mean that you're not up to the fight. Um, we have Public Health England, which is exactly there, to inform the public impartially of what the pros and cons are. But like I said, you know, you said there's something about the state trying to control mm. the water supply. Go to Birmingham and talk to people in Birmingham and see if they mind. You know, if it was such a big issue, I think people are genuinely... Don't you think you could it? possibly turn it on its head and, and get people to say, why haven't we got it? Because look at, our, you know, kids in Birmingham aren't having to have their teeth out and we're sick of this happening. I mean, maybe you actually need to completely turn it upside down. Mm. And say, so why aren't we doing it already? It's not fair, but I mean, we've got it and we haven't. Maybe you need to find some local yeah. politicians who'll seize it and, absolutely, and, absolutely, and that's true. take up the yeah. banner. Yeah. Uh, fact, well, in fact, all of you were, were kind of portrayed as toothless children. Um, <laughs> Jennifer, what did you make of the overall style of I'm uh, very sad to have lost my teeth, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, it's a really, really well done, actually. Very um, kind of calm, but persuasive and, and authoritative. So, so I thought that was um, really excellent. Uh, I, guess, I guess my question would be, uh, so it, along the lines of why hasn't it been done, for me one of the more persuasive arguments from the policy makers I hear is, is uh, when you can say how much something costs and how much it would save them mm -hmm. and you know how it would lift the burden on the NHS and so on. So I just wonder are there, are there really um, very well evidenced numbers of to, how, how much does one of those yeah, two I mean, extractions The stats cost? that I use, they compare the six million Brits that are already, already fluoridated against the rest of the country. These aren't like small study sizes. Mm -hmm. These are you know, millions of people. And they look at every single hospital, what are the admission rates in all of those hospitals for tooth extractions. So um, the stats really are strong. Uh, but the actual cost. Sorry, cost. Sorry. cost. Sorry. cost yes. Not just how many people are, it's happening to, but how much does that cost the NHS? How much could you actually save? I think the last year um, for tooth extractions in under 18 is about 60 million. Mm. That's not. No, potatoes. it's not negligible. Um, okay. Funnily, I do wonder if you're international, uh, this, this, this clearly has a, a resonance beyond the UK. Oh, I, absolutely. I, I mean, just thinking about this, uh, on your map, actually, we, there's a particular part of Africa that seems to have, I think you're portraying the place as having, oh, maybe it wasn't yeah. Africa. Mm. Uh, yes. So, what, is, yeah. um, what happens is, like I said, what fluoride is naturally occurring. Uh -huh. uh, different climates have different. Uh -huh ecologies and geology systems. Mm. So in parts of um, Africa, mm. it already occurs at beneficial levels. Uh -huh. Amazing, uh -huh. amazing. Uh, see Ireland. That's it. Ireland seems to be. Ireland, yeah. Ireland, 100% water fluoridated. Absolutely. As is Hong Kong. What, added, put in? Yes. yes. So yeah, they've just taken the decision? Yeah. They just do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I think this is an area, but what I found mm. fascinating about it is the kind of evidence has been brought to bear. Mm. And that is a situation where if there were policy papers mm. and all sorts of mm. campaigns, uh, things could change, uh, uh, definitely. This, this could transform things for the right kind of... Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, another very good three minutes. Thank you very much, Nika Ross. Well, what a fantastic display of uh, talent, tackling the uh, biggest...
I would say, sorry Louis, but I, I would say this is the, the best we've had in terms of the quality of the presentations. And I've been doing it for four years and it didn't exist before that, so it's <laughs> uh, We've now seen all ten uh, of our contenders for the glittering prize that is Policy Idol 2018. The judging panel will now be incarcerated in a soundproof, uh, bulletproof and Russian boxproof bunk. <laughs> consider their awards, uh, but you of course uh, also have a key part to play in deciding which of our idol contenders walks away with the coveted audience prize. Uh, it's a hugely difficult job, it's a hugely demanding task, uh, but I know that you are going to be up to it. Uh, now, to vote this year, slightly different for anyone who has been here before, slightly different, we're asking you to do a oh, bit more yeah. of heavy lifting. Um, you need to follow the link that is on your, on your tables. So you're going to need a bit of your Good own evening. technology here. Welcome. But you should be able to uh, here quite we go easily again. get there. You go to something that you see. Do you see the uh, URL on the, on the thing? It's in very, very small writing for old people. But uh, it's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash policy eyeball 051. Uh, quite know how you put that into your phone without typing it in. Oh, there it is up there. Uh, so, Slot that in, uh, pick your favourite one, and all of that will, um, all of that will be, uh, be brilliant. Um, you have five minutes or so to, uh, to gather your thoughts, uh, collect any bribes from contestants, and manage to uh, <laughs> log on and, uh, uh, and, 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 and pick up your winnings. So good luck with that. Uh, our judges are now going to go, as I say, into their pod, uh, and we'll be back here with some results. Uh, in just a few minutes' time. Thank you very much indeed. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we are but seconds away now from learning who our winners are for Policy Idol 2018. To award the prizes, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage the man who introduced us to the too difficult box for <laughs> policy areas that politicians deemed too hard to crack. <laughs> There were certainly a few of those when he was Home Secretary under Tony Blair. Ladies and gentlemen, the Right Honourable Charles Clark. <laughs> right. Are you ready? The first prize I'm going to announce is the winner of the prize for style. Ladies and gentlemen, the style of Policy Idol 2018. The winner is Rebecca Ortega. Substance, the judges' award for substance. And the winner of that in Policy Idol 2018 is Ross Hills. very much indeed. The, uh, well, uh, the uh, next award is the award from you, the people, uh, the person that you in this room felt was the most persuasive. And the winner of the audience pick of Policy Idol 2018, don't sit down, it's Ross Hill! <laughs> Uh, <laughs> right. 
Uh, and now the moment we have all been waiting for. Uh, the announcement of the overall winner, the champion of Policy Idol 2018. The overall champion tonight is... At this point, I need really a bit of a drop. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, it's only my job this evening to say thank you to a large number of people. Firstly, to the organisers of this event. It's the fourth of the Policy Idol uh, competitions. And I think right through the whole process, it's gone from step to step to step, just growing and growing in interest, authority, quality that we saw tonight. So firstly, thank you very much to the organisers for tonight and what's been done. Thank you too to the Economic and Social Research Council, I say, looking at uh, Jennifer, whose funding has helped to make this possible. Thank you also, Mark, to you. Uh, you've conducted in a tremendous style. I thought I was telling the winners who were really coming through when you suddenly began to switch in your interrogation as though the person was actually a minister or something. You know, like as we went through. But your whole uh, stewardship of this whole evening has been absolutely tremendous. So I want to say thanks to you. To I thought the panel asked a whole string of very interesting questions about which I'll just make one comment, but they come from a fantastic range of experience. They've put a lot of time in, and they've really thought a lot about what to do. I thought the interesting thing that emerged from their questions was the difficult problem of getting from A to B, i.e. from where we are today to the ideal which they described. And on all the tremendous ideas, I think we can say that all of them were really excellent ideas that were presented this evening. The kind of questions that were, that were coming from the panel, well, how do you get from where we are today to that picture that you've set, whose vision you've set out so clearly? And I think I'd say to the organisers, think about that in the structuring of this for future years, because it's one thing to set out a vision of where we ought to be in a relatively ideal world. It's another thing to think, how do we get from A to B? And what impressed me, Mark, in the answers that the panellists, all of them, I think, really, uh, to the questions the panellists asked and the answers they were given by the competitors, was actually the competitors all thought about that problem a lot. Mm. They answered the questions from the panel in a very strong, authoritative way with a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. They thought through the problems. And I think finding ways to draw that out in the process would be a good thing to do. So can I ask you all to thank the panel for the effort that they put in this evening to make this And finally, just to say again that this has been the fourth of the Policy Idol series. It will continue. It's been a very successful initiative. And it's about an absolutely fundamental thing, which we were just talking at at the table just before this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, Mark made his final introduction. It's critically important not only to think about what the problems are and how we address them, but to be able to articulate clearly and directly how those come up. It's no good writing it away in a nice little note, that's valuable, but what's even more important is to be able to describe it. And what I thought was really impressive for the competitors, who are the last group that I want to thank uh, in this final closing, is the articulacy with which all of you were able to explain to this very disparate group what you were trying to say, how you were trying to do it. That's a skill we need a great deal more of in the academic world generally. And that's a skill which you all demonstrated this evening. So can we all just thank again the competitors for the work they put in. evening, but the, uh, the, the enduring point is think about things, address the challenges, make the case. As long as universities do that, 
we'll be in a very strong position in our society, and that's what we have to do. Thank you for asking me to be here this evening, and thank you, Mark, for your wonderful work. Thank you. Policy Idol 2018 is almost at a close. Um, I'm looking over at the Freudian dream wall now. Uh, if, I, I do hope you all get a chance before you uh, disappear uh, to go and have a look at that. And I, I, I noticed that every single one of the Policy Idol presentations has been turned into a, uh, a sort of, know, what is that, A2 or something? Is that? I don't know. A big, big poster. Uh, anyway, uh, the fantastic uh, works of art that we can, uh, we can have as a, a legacy for tonight. Uh, I'd like to add my thanks to our, all of our potential idols. A truly fantastic display of talent and indeed to our brilliant judging panel uh, for sorting out the swimmers from the stinkers and the sensations from the suckers. Uh, I would ask all our finalists if you could uh, just stay for some photos at the end, but to everyone else, it has been another wonderful evening here at King's. Farewell, safe journey home. Thanks very much for making Policy Idol 2018 such a wonderful success. Good night and take care. Thanks.